Good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. Welcome to the Churchtown Church of God. We're walking through the hallway here getting ready. There's the church picnic. If you are a church Tonian, get yourself up there for the church picnic. So we make sure that we have enough chicken for you. Gonna make some chicken, some side dishes. It's gonna be good. I don't know why I have a southern accent, but I do. There's the sanctuary. Oh my goodness, what a Sunday. We spent a long time in here on Sunday. We was a praying. We was a singing. We was a praising. We were in the word. It was pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. We had a nice little conversation. It was really wonderful. Talking about church, talking about pastoring, talking about leadership, just sitting and talking. That's one thing we can do here at Churchtown, which I'm not afraid to do, is just sit and talk. Sit and talk. You want to know how we think about something? The congregation can ask. You know, want to know what's up in the church? The congregation can ask. Just ask. We'll tell you. <clears throat> or we'll talk about it. No, not tell you. But you know what I mean? We can go back and forth and we can figure things out and that's the way it should be. So good morning, good morning. My tripod's a little wacko here. Hold on a second. Good morning, Liz. Hard at it at school. Mother, whoops, and I did it again. There we go. Hard at it at school. Being a mom, <clears throat> being a pro, doing all the things. Oh my goodness. We know how that is. We know how that is. We've been through it before, Kelly and I, and now we're helping out with our own grandkids because it's tough, man. It's a tough deal. So. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Father. We do thank you for the opportunity to be together this day. We pray that what we do and what we say blesses you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So here we are. I'm just looking for today's scripture. I, oh, excuse me. As you can see, I got some things ready, but not everything. And let me tell you, this has been quite a journey. Quite a journey through this uh, idea of worship and what is worship and how do we worship. And it has led to a variety of different topics. What is church? Why are we in church? What do we do in church? Is worship everything? Everything that we do, everything that we say, is it can be everything. Well, no. Because everything means everything, we have to be more specific than that. Because if worship can be everything, then worship can be anything. And we spoke very openly in church about that. And, and that's, that's what you see. You know, last week, if you get to Church Town Weekly, you, I, read, I, I wrote about... Orthodox Christianity and faith in the resurrected Christ and the truth of the word of God has been pushed to the margins of society. We were once in the center of society. And I don't know if that is such a good thing, but we, you know, the, the ideas of Judeo-Christian ideas were the centerpiece of our law, centerpiece of our culture, centerpiece of our ideas about family, justice, all these different things, and now they're not. But in the effort to maintain that, that power, that prestige, that wealth, and you can call it the, the mainstream, dare I say, Christian church in America, has done anything and everything that it can to attract people. And in so doing, anything has become form of worship. Worship yourself, primarily. Worship the idea of being an influencer, having power and influence. Worship money, as we see through the prosperity gospel, and come to church so you, you may be blessed Worship all of the sinful pleasures of the flesh through taking drugs and sex cults and those sorts of things. Worship the idea that you are your own God. New age this and Unitarian that. 
in the effort to stay relevant because human beings are desperate to do that, the church has done anything. And we have lived by this idea that worship can be everything. Now, like I said on Sunday, for the average Christian, for the understanding Christian, it has a different connotation, meaning we understand we say everything that we do, whether you do it, whether you eat as you eat, as you sleep, whatever you drink, or do it to the glory of God. The work that you do, do it for the glory of God. What you speak, how you speak, where you are, what you're doing, how you treat your neighbor, do it for the glory of God. The Orthodox Christian understands that, but like I said, when we get it in our heads, that worship is any, any, everything, it makes it more, it makes it easier for us to be led astray. Therefore, worship can be anything. So I hope that that makes sense. That was one of the points that we talked about on Sunday. And Sunday was all about how not to worship. Now, of course, <clears throat> there's naturally overlap when, you're start, when you start talking about the scriptures and and Jesus says, get behind me, I never knew you after all of these folks said we did all these things in your name. We even talked about that last week here. It's hard to talk about how not to worship or how, you know, how to worship when you're talking about how not to worship. I mean, the, the compare and the contrast. But this week's focus will be on, okay then, what does scripture say? I'm not going to ask the question, how do we worship? Or how do you worship? We could go on and on and on about that and have, probably have as many different, well, when I'm walking uh, you know, through the, through the forest, when I'm on the Appalachian Trail, I can make many testimonies uh, in regarding where I feel most worshipful, including in this sanctuary right here. <clears throat> I'm going to ask the question, what does scripture say? how we are to worship. And we're gonna take that. Now, obviously, it will overlap in the other direction probably this week. Well, we don't do that all the time, do we? Therefore, we have a negative example. My scriptural wanderings have taken me to Isaiah 58, which you may or may not consider a, a text that is particularly about worship. <clears throat> but then again, I don't think many of us, or, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's not a coincidence. I mean, the, the weather needs to decide what it's going to do. The pollen needs to decide what it's going to do. It is late August, and I'm getting high pollen alerts on my phone. I, who knows? I can certainly feel it. Can you hear it in my chest, in my voice? What a season, what a season. It's been a, it's been a difficult season weather-wise, not necessarily for me as a human. I mean, I got these seasonal allergies and it, the pollen seems to be rather consistent throughout the course of the season. But like I said, we, the, it has taken its toll between the drought and then the heat and humidity and then the thunderstorms and hail. It has taken a toll on the physical property here Last Sunday, up there, uh, there's a mini split, and last Sunday people got to witness this mini split just explode with water, you know, running down all over the place, all over the organ. It's, you know, it's, just, it's hard to handle all of this uh, without money breakdown. So, now that, it's been harder on the equipment than it has been on me. But we, we said, how many people have considered Swipe left to reveal comments. Okay, so there we go. Uh, okay, Liz and Mama D and Carol and check in. Let me know that you're here. Let me hear. I can see the individuals here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Turning on the Lights. Talking about worship. <clears throat> and leading into Isaiah 58, I said last week in church, a couple days ago, right? Sunday. The Sermon on the Mount, do you often consider that a sermon about worship? Well, if you go to the Sermon on the Mount, 
and you go to Matthew 4. Let's just take a look at this. And, and, and again, I read this a billion times. Okay, maybe not a billion times. <clears throat> where are we? Matthew 5. Where's Matthew 4? Here it is. Jesus being tested in the wilderness. <clears throat> away, uh, away, away from me, Satan. Okay, so he's tested in the wilderness. And finally he says, away from me, Satan. I just lost Isaiah 58. We'll have to look that up again. I'm a mess. Good morning. Everybody check in with me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then Jesus goes out and begins to preach. He calls his disciples and he begins to serve the Lord. And I had never before considered this, what we call the Sermon on the Mount as a, a, a scripture, a teaching, <clears throat> a text that tells us how to worship. Good morning. And I'm tempted now to take another month and go through this Sermon on the Mount. But he bookends it with the temptation and he says, it is written, it is written in the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and serve him only. Worship only God and serve only God. And then at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, whoever follows my teaching is like one who builds their house on solid rock the rock of Christ, the rock of the profession in faith in Jesus Christ. Do you remember when Peter says, oh, you are the Messiah, you are the chosen one, you are our savior. And he says, surely this is of God, of, of God, Peter, not of you. This is of God's Holy Spirit. And upon this rock, I will build my church upon this profession. So we have these bookends worship God and serve him only. And then he goes through all of these teachings. What do you think they're about? They're about worshiping God and serving him only. How do you do that? Boom. You follow the will of God because all of these teachings say, you know, it is written, but I tell you that the will of God is Fascinating stuff. So we worship God alone. And we talked, we talked at length about that. What does that mean to you? And another point that I brought up on Sunday was we talk about these, these ideas of worship that are brought up in Scripture, which means to fall face down in the presence of a holy God. And when we talk about Old Testament stuff, and we, when we talk about the example falling face down in the presence of a holy God and worshiping and understanding. And I said that the, the glory the, 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 of being a New Testament Christian, of being a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ is that we know to fall down in the face of a holy God. But by the grace of God, we are able to look back up and walk with him, talk with him, Seek his will as we dwell in his kingdom. Oh, that's the amazing power. <clears throat> that's the amazing power of the good news of the resurrection. So let's do some reading here this morning. We'll get you on your way. Something for you to check out. Isaiah 58. Is the Sermon on the Mount a scripture? Good morning, Deb. Is the Sermon on the Mount a scripture about worship? I think so. It's a scripture about, we can, we can look at this Sermon on the Mount from many different angles, through many different lenses, as I say, and I never looked at it before through the lens of worship. But he distinctly tells us, as he, is, as he tells Satan, you're done, get behind me. Get out of here. Because it says in scripture, the word of God says, worship only God and serve him only. 
Now, boom, he goes and he ministers. Begins to profess, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Good stuff. <clears throat> Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem they eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and not ha and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Well, that sounds pretty good so far. You can hear that God is a bit displeased because it's pretty obvious in that passage that some of the worship is fake. The descendants of Jacob, it says, declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not broken the commands of God. So on the one hand, they're, God's aware that they're aware that they've broken commands, but in, and it doesn't seem like they're truly repentant. They want what most human beings want, and that is the best of both worlds, if you will, <clears throat> the best of the spiritual through a healthy relationship with God through Jesus Christ, salvation people want. Some people see that as the carrot in front of the stick in terms of Christianity. If I've got salvation and I'm going to find a church or a preacher or a denomination that says, once I make my profession in faith, it is absolutely secure. And then I'm going to go out and I'm going to do what my physical body wants, what myself wants as well. And that it's impossible. You can't. We, we will always try that. But it, it, it doesn't work. And the example that I just pointed out, the person obviously knows that they're trying to pull the wool over God's eyes. Well, I'm going to a denomination that speaks about eternal security. Once you, know, once you make your profession of faith, you're locked in, baby. And that, and that is Catholic ideology as well, by the way. You come up through and do all the catechism and you take your first communion, you become a member of the church, which is seen as the literal body of Christ. Boom, you're done. You're good. You can move away from it. You can do anything that you want from that point in time, but your security, your eternal security is secure. <laughs> I mean, Try to find a way to phrase that that didn't sound that stupid. But you can't do that. Like if I said, okay, well, how can I do this? Well, I'm going to follow Catholic theology. I'll join the Catholic Church. Good morning. Everybody check in. And I'm not, ba it's not bashing. This is just part of the theology. So I go through everything. But I'm knowing that I'm doing it for ulterior motives. That's what the, the psalm is talking, or the, the, the passage of Isaiah is speaking about here. I know that I'm doing it for alternative motives. And this is where it leads with, for me, into worship. Why do you go to church? What do you do when you're there? And what does it mean? Are you worshiping? <clears throat> One, are you worshiping, worshiping, only when you're in church? Is that the only time that this theophany, right, the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, this realization of the presence of the Holy One is with you? The only time? That's not to say that church and, and the environment of being with fellow believers and hearing the word and praying and singing the songs and all of that can't lead to a more mountaintop experience as you experience the collective experience of God's Holy Spirit. But one of the first self-examinations is, is that what church is for? The other 167 hours of the week, not so much. That's one of the first points of discernment as to, okay, what do you think church is about? What do you think worship is? 
Are you recognizing and being intentional in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ that you worship him? I say constantly, but that's also impossible. We are not the, the 24 elders of Revelation with him in his presence all the time. But are we, right? Is it throughout the course of the week? Do you feel that worship in the little things of your life, in the people that you meet, in the, in, in your prayer life, and through the music you listen to, and through your family conversations and your prayers around the dinner table? And do you worship him? So that's one of the first points of discernment. Because if you're like, okay, no, it's all good because I go to church. It's all good because I go to church. And, and moreover, I go to an orthodox, you know, like Bible-believing church. So I get my little shot in the arm every week. I'm good. I believe, good morning, Xavier. I believe what they're saying. I, I'm good. Knowing that there isn't anything else the rest of the week. That's the same as what Isaiah is speaking of here. You know what you're doing, man. You know what you're trying to do. You're trying to play God and not play like be God. You're trying to play him in some sort of a game like, look at me. I'm worshiping during this time. I believe what they're saying during this time. But then you go to something like the Sermon on the Mount and you hear Jesus Christ himself say, worship God only, serve God only, and then go through what we see as like three chapters, four chapters of behaviors regarding worship and you don't do any of them. Do you think that your faith at the end, all right, Matthew 7, do you feel that your faith is, is rooted in the solid rock? So God here is speaking through the, the prophet Isaiah and saying, it's good that they're doing this, but I know that they're playing me. Human beings, right? And this sounds an awful lot like we did, <clears throat> we did this in your name. We did that in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And Jesus Christ says, get behind me, you evil do, or get behind me. You evildoers, I never knew you. What? Listen to this. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. They seem eager. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Ouch. Okay, one of the prime, one of the big three, ways to worship and seek God in the Old Testament is through fasting. And so this representation is pulled out in the word of God and we see the same exact thing. And again, you want a New Testament translation of that? Look at Matthew 7, when the people say, we cast out demons in your name, we heal the sick in your name, etc., etc. And he says, get behind me, I never knew you, you evildoers. These people are saying, but Lord, you see our fasting, we're following the law, we're doing all the things that we should be doing, but God sees the heart, as we say. And God speaks right back to them, I know you are. But while you are professing faith and professing to be worshiping me, you are treating others like garbage. And your fasting itself will end in fisticuffs. Now, I don't know if that means, like, look at me, I'm fasting better and harder than you, and we end up fighting over that literally, or if it just means they don't care if they even do violence while they're professing to worship a holy God. But God is seeing right through the fake. 
And that's the point of the whole passage. And we'll go on a little bit more, but Isaiah 58, read it today, through the lens of worship. And I'm telling you more and more, I'm thinking as I go from passage to passage and old to new and prophet and wisdom and Torah and, and gospel, I, I, more and more I, that all of scripture, and maybe this is a dumb, naive statement. Maybe there would be a thousand theologians out there that would go, duh, all of scripture is about worship. We look at scripture through the eyes of worship. Because every time I turn to a scripture and I look through it, look at it through the lens of worship, how does this speak to me, teach me about how to worship? It's there. And like I said, there's probably a million people way smarter than me that are going, duh, no fake. But this is, I was very excited on Sunday. I couldn't, I was very animated on Sunday because this is exciting for me. I'm not going to fake that. It's super exciting for me. It's like a new lease on who, how to be a follower of Christ. I thought I was doing all the things and they were sincere. I don't, of course, as a human being, there are those times, but for the most part, I'm not like Isaiah 58. I'm like, okay, well, I got a job as a pastor, so I better do this, that, and the other thing, and I think I can fake out God to make sure I believe I'm, you know, for the most part, the things that I do in reading and singing and worshiping and praying and submitting and those sorts of intentional things I do are sincere. But now I'm, I'm, my eyes are being opened to so much more. Let's look at another part of the past thing, <clears throat> passage. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? This is what you're giving me? I call for fasting. And on the one hand, okay, so you're like, okay, I'll follow the law, I'll do my fasting. I'll lay in my sackcloth while I'm running my business. My thoughts haven't changed. I'm, I seek not to draw any closer to the Lord. I'm just trying to f do what he says to do. Good morning, Nancy. <clears throat> Is not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. What does that mean? Well, there's a list here of very specific things. Well, no, they're not actually very specific things. Overall, that list <clears throat> means all that you have belongs to the Lord. So use it according to my will. Who you are is a result of the Lord's creation. Use it according to my will. If you are wealthy and have much and profess to be a follower of God, Old Testament, submit yourself to God and care for my creation. Care for your own family. Care for my creation human beings, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, and whatever they may need. If you have abundance, you are hoarding that, and that is not of God. I have given unto you much, so much is expected. 
The true sign of a follower is the humility, and not just humility like, I'm going to come across another human being and show myself to be very humble and meek and mild. It is humbling humility, humbling your pride and ego and sense of self before a holy God. And seeking his will. For only those will find the narrow path are those who actually follow the will of my Father. Scripture teaches us through Jesus Christ. Those who find that narrow path are those who actually follow the will of my Father. So you see, not, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Isaiah 58 is saying, you want, you want this, you want me. Being in relationship with me is not like being relation, in relationship with one of the dead idols of the pagans. I don't just sit up there and then you do things and hope that I like them. That's all false worship anyway because they're all dead and useless. Worshiping me means turning yourself over to me, trusting me, and following my will. And he talks about caring for his creation and his created. That's a part of the idea of generosity and giving that we talk about here at Churchtown. We don't talk about giving money. We don't talk about, ask, we don't ask for money. We don't take up an offering. But we do look at things like this and say, this is who we are as a people. This is how we care for one another from the, the congregation out, like in concentric circles until we are giving to worldwide ministries. If we have in abundance, we understand that we are to serve his creation. Interesting stuff. Here it is. <clears throat> the Lord will guide you always. Verse 11, we'll finish off with this. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a scorched land and will strengthen your fame. Frame, not your fame. He will satisfy your needs in a scorched land and he will strengthen your frame. You will be physically able to do different things. <clears throat> You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Does that sound familiar? Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins, we know that that happens, and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of, treat, of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We hit another one of the big three. And that is the Sabbath. The big three of the Old Testament. The Sabbath. What do we do on the Sabbath? The Lord has ordained this time in the Old Testament the seventh day, Saturday, the day of rest. Do you observe his command? Now we're talking Old Testament here. Do you observe his command? And his command is not only to rest, but to worship. You are given extra time by the Lord. You are told by the Lord to lay down your plow 
Lay down your work, cease your commerce, and focus on him. Are we doing that earnestly with a heart that seeks the Lord? Or, just like fasting, are you like, okay, it's the Sabbath. This is what he is saying in Isaiah. And you say, well, we don't observe the Sabbath. Oh, it's a whole different discussion as we cross, move through the cross into the, and Sunday, we worship on the first day of the week, not the last. That's because Jesus Christ flipped everything around. He was resurrected on the first day. Sabbath is the seventh day. And we don't often think of that, right? We don't often think of Sunday as the first day of the week. Do you? I mean, for the longest time, I guess, especially pre-Christian, it's the end of the week. It's like the last day of the week. And then Monday starts a new week because Monday starts a new work week. Anyway, when we look throughout Scripture, we see the same thread. Will you and are you willing, will you be intentional about submitting yourself to me in the Old Testament via my commands. In the New Testament, seeking the will of God first, seeking the kingdom first. Are you doing those things in earnest, in humility, setting self aside and seeking me in the Old Testament through the law in the New Testament through faith in Jesus Christ. The message is the same. The heart condition of the human is the same. The way that it is covenantially displayed, covenantially sanctified through by the Lord has changed. But how we are in relationship and what that means and what that looks like and the, the way our heart must break for him has not. Whatever scripture you may be reading today, read it through the lens of worship and see how it turns out for you. Father, we thank you for the time that we share together. We thank you for opening our eyes And I pray that all that will come across this and hear this and will look in the mirror today and discern for themselves the earnestness with which they come to you, the intentionality with which they submit themselves to you. In Jesus' name, Lord, guide us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you guys. I hope that you have a fantastic day. A little rain wouldn't be bad, although we do want to go for a little motorcycle ride tonight. So if you are a rider, Churchtown rider or not, we're leaving the parking lot here around five. Just going for a couple of hours. God bless you guys. Take care and we will, good Lord willing and the river don't rise, see you Friday morning for turning on the lights. <laughs>